Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jenna Flanagan. It was a news-filled weekend which promises to be a week filled with more of the same. Whether looking at headlines or surfing the TV or internet, you could get whiplash from watching all the headlines unfold. Where to begin? Well, let's start with Saturday and President Trump's war of words with the NFL over players who kneel in resistance. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, get that son of a off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! The NFL fired back. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell released a statement on Saturday morning calling Trump's remarks divisive. More than 130 players protested the national anthem this weekend, as observed by Associated Press reporters. Mayoral hopeful Nicole Maliotakis weighed in on the debate, stating, quote, NFL players are professional athletes, and it's about time they acted professionally by leaving their personal and political views in the locker room, end quote. And in case you missed it, Trump issued some new travel limitations to the U.S. from eight countries to go into effect next month, deleting Sudan and Iraq and adding North Korea, Chad and Venezuela. These issues played out while Dreamers and their supporters across the state held a DACA day of action to renounce the expected decision by the administration to deport these people who came to the United States as children and have no memory of their country of origin. But the headline here in New York City that certainly was not lost in the shuffle of this breaking news, the sentencing of disgraced former congressman and mayoral hopeful Anthony Weiner. Weiner was sentenced by a federal judge to 21 months for his latest sexting scandal, acts that involved a 15-year-old girl and had political ramifications that led all the way to Hillary Clinton and her race for the White House. And that's where we start. We have a lot to discuss and dissect tonight, and here with me to help digest and breaking it all down is Politico's Laura Namias. And Laura, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So let's start immediately with the sentencing of Anthony Weiner. First of all, we understand prosecutors were asking for 27, as high as 27 months. He got 21. Was that showing leniency? And if so, why? The judge talked today about several factors that went into her sentencing decision. Um, she thought a lot about um, whether or not going to prison would be a personal deterrent for Anthony Weiner. And what was interesting was that she said, maybe not. Uh, it might not help him personally with his problem. But there's also um, the fact that you have to weigh the idea of general deterrence when you're giving someone a sentence. And she felt that it was important to send a strong message um, to the public about the seriousness of his crime and that because he's a public figure and a notorious public figure that he deserved significant jail time. So she came in at the low end of, of the um, sentencing guidelines, but it's still almost two years in jail for the former congressman. I also understand that Anthony Weiner's soon-to-be ex-wife, Huma Abedin, did write a letter to the judge asking for leniency, but was she there today in court? She was not. Um, he seemed very alone today. So, of course, speaking of Huma Abedin, uh, a lot of this played out while she was working as an aide to Hillary Clinton when she was running for president. And there have been suggestions that James Comey's investigation into the sexting scandal did set the wheels in motion that eventually delivered the election to Donald Trump at the end of the election cycle. Do you think that's a fair assessment to make? I think that that's something that uh, people in the former Clinton campaign like to say, but I, I don't think that if you did a full survey of everyone who voted for Donald Trump, or if that were even possible, that they would all say that this was the, the thing that caused them to vote for Donald Trump. I think it was a variety of factors. All right, well, turning away from Huma Abedin and Anthony Weiner and turning our attention to President Trump, I'm sure, as you know, this weekend, he did get into a war of words with uh, several high-profile athletes and, of course, the NFL, as we mentioned in the intro. Now, this, of course, is all happening with the backdrop of uh, his previous travel ban expiring and a new um, travel restriction being rolled out. And then, of course, there is the re-attempt to repeal and replace um, the Affordable Care Act, which doesn't seem to be looking like it's going to go too well. So the question is, how much of this 
NFL kneeling at the uh, national anthem, respect for the flag, police brutality situation. How much of this is just a distraction? Well, I think at some point yesterday he said that he doesn't care about any of that anymore and all he cares about is tax reform. On to the next thing. So um, he has a very short attention span, it seems like. Uh, but it's all very distracting for all of us, isn't it? Um, there's a lot to pay attention to and a lot going on at any given moment. He's juggling a lot of things. We'll see some details of the tax reform plan that they want to put out sometime in the middle of this week. So that'll be going on at the same time that all of the rest of this is going on. And, and, and there is just a lot constantly going on with this administration. But to bring it back to New York a little bit, we recently heard that the Republican mayoral candidate, Nicole Maliotakis, did come out in support of President Trump's statements in regards to the NFL. And in such a heavily Democratic city like New York, does supporting these divisive statements from the president tank her chances of ever being elected mayor of New York City, or was this always a shot in the dark? She, a poll last week, a Marist poll issued last week, showed her um, almost 50 points behind Mayor de Blasio in the race. It's an overwhelmingly Democratic city, like you said. She has a lot to overcome. At this point, making a statement like the one that she made, um, kind of hewing close to conservative, Republican, ortho orthodoxy, um, is more of a sign of what she intends to do after the race, uh, that she's laying the groundwork potentially for a run for Staten Island Borough President or for uh, Dan Donovan's congressional seat or for something statewide. Um, the state GOP chairman, Ed Cox, has said that he thinks she'd be a particularly good candidate for statewide office. Well, I would assume as much because, of course, as we know, no politician says anything that doesn't have a meaning or a message behind it. But pivoting to yet another subject, which would be the new travel restrictions. Uh, now, we do know that the administration's previous travel ban is set to expire and that they've repackaged a new set of restrictions to try to control who's coming into the country. How does this help at least uh, the administration further their agenda? Well, they changed the countries so that it's no longer all ma or majority Muslim countries. They've added North Korea and Venezuela. And if you'll remember that when um, the original travel bans were uh, challenged in court, they judges struck them down on the argument that um, the president and his aides, uh, former mayor Rudy Giuliani, had described something very similar as a Muslim ban, which would have been unconstitutional. So the president's previous tweets and descriptions uh, of, of what he intended to do and people close to him, uh, their similar descriptions were used to strike it down in a lot of cases. Um, the way that this new travel ban is worded and the countries that it affects seems like it could address that problem. So of all the things we've heard from the president this past weekend and last week, one of the things we haven't heard from him is the fate of Puerto Rico, which is struggling right now in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. I, I think uh, struggling is, is maybe too light a word. Um, there is no power. There's no cell service. Uh, there are people sleeping on the baggage carousels at the airport. This is a U.S. territory. There are millions of people there. There is a lack of fresh water, dialysis patients who need electricity, uh, uh, senior citizens who are, are struggling, um, a lack of food. All of the agriculture was destroyed, produce destroyed. This island has been devastated. And uh, it's remarkable that we actually haven't heard a lot from the president or from Congress um, in general about what they intend to do to help part of the country, a significant part of the country with millions and millions of, of residents. Well, that's interesting because even though we haven't heard that much from the federal level, we have heard quite a lot from the local level, state and city. Uh, Governor Cuomo recently took a trip down to Puerto Rico and has been very vocal about his support for the U.S. citizens who are struggling in that island. Yeah, well, New York is home to one of the largest, I think actually the largest population of Puerto Rican immigrants in the country. Um, so there's a strong affinity between the state and, and the territory. And the governor and the mayor and 
elected officials with roots in Puerto Rico, a family in Puerto Rico, including uh, mayoral candidate Nicole Maliotakis, Representative Nidia Velasquez, the city council speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito. All right, well, listen, Laura, thank you again for joining us on the show. Always appreciate having you on to help us break down some of the complicated issues of the day. Thank you.